400 years without a comb, the inferior seed. With whom do I make reference? My foreparents. They took an unsolicited journey one day to a foreign and strange land, thrust into slavery, a traumatic experience that cultivated them for the planting of what I call the inferior seed. The comb to the African represented more than an implement for the grooming of his hair. Ornately carved and beautifully fashioned, it told a story, his story. The designs on the comb linked him to a particular tribe with a particular culture. It also gave personal information concerning the owner, such as his status in the tribe, the wealth he possessed, and his personal history. The comb of the African, compatible with the grooming requirements that the unique texture of his hair and the elements imposed upon him, were the work of art that few have ever equaled. Contrary to popular belief, grooming and the art of hair care found unique expression within African society. African women wore hairstyles that defy expression in contemporary Western cultures. The art of braiding was commonplace and played a major role in the style that adorned the heads of African men and women. An African man could frequently be found carving a comb with meticulous care for himself or to present as a gift to the woman of his heart. The comb that found expression through the artistic skill that he possessed represented an extension of himself and the culture that bore him. The world of the African changed drastically beginning in the 14th century with the Portuguese and terminating in the 18th with the Americans, as millions were transported to distant shores for the purpose of slave labor. Needless to say, his comb did not accompany him to these far distant shores. Grooming would cease to be of utmost importance to him for some time, as he was led in chains to his final destination before leaving Africa, the infamous island of glory. On the island of Gori, in what is now Dakar, Senegal, 
African men, women, and children were detained for months at a time for exportation to the Americas. The conditions of their detention, which defy the imagination, still speak out as a testament to the deaths mankind can sink. La Maison des Aclaves, the house of the slaves, still smells of the urine and body stench left some 290 years ago. Africans were crowded so close together that sometimes the dead and dying could not fall. The crying of the captives so filled the night air that sleep was anything but possible. The smell of human excrement paralyzed the nostrils and caused breathing to become a difficult process. Many Africans, as they were being led to the waiting ships, managed to take their own lives on the merciful rocks below. Those unfortunate souls, strong enough to survive the terror of Gore, left there for their final destination, slavery in America. The unsolicited journey, which began from the island of Gore and terminated in the Americas, claimed the lives of many more of this human cargo. The hair of the African, encased with excrement, pus, and other debris, paradoxically hardened into a protective hat. When the African reached the shores of this country, due to the combined effect of the trauma of his experience, he was in a state of physical and neurological collapse. His physical and mental states were perfect for the planting of the inferior seed. possibly been going through his already overwrought mind as he viewed the strange-looking people before him. Perhaps he was thinking of his home, which he knew by now he would never see again. Okay, he's going to hurt you now. Go ahead and take a look at him. Go ahead, go ahead and touch him. Now, this one will do some good work out there in the field. Uh -huh. Come on, don't be afraid of him, man. He ain't gonna hurt you. It's like wool. What do you think? Ain't like no man I ever seen before. But we'll take him. Come on up, come on up and take a look at him. He ain't gonna hurt you. Come on, come on. Come on up and take a look at him. He's strong. He's not gonna hurt you. He's in his shackles now. Come on, take a look at him. He ain't gonna hurt you. He's in his shackles. He ain't gonna hurt you at all. The touch that stroked his face in the most impersonal examination of his life told him that there was something different, strange, wrong with him. Generations of his descendants would spend their lives trying to answer the question that perplexed the African. I got three females here. Take a look at them. Go ahead, touch them. Go ahead, they're not going to hurt you. Good help. African, totally removed from his homeland, totally severed from his culture, had nothing with which to defend himself against the brainwashing treatment he was being subjected to. He thought constantly of his home, and for a while this helped him endure the unendurable. His mind reflected on the warning of the old wise men who told the people, the pale man will come soon. He will take away our warriors and run into a strange land. They're so black. They're so black. They're so black. And their hair. The 
African, totally removed from his homeland, totally feathered from his culture, had nothing with which to defend himself against the brainwashing treatment he was being subjected to. He thought constantly of his home, and for a while this helped him endure the unendurable. His mind reflected on the warning of the old wise men who told the people, the pale man will come soon. He will take away our warriors and run into a strange land. It will be a painful time for our people. The wise men, to whom few paid serious attention due to their inability to comprehend paleness, were correct in their prediction. The slave, due to the subhuman treatment that he received, was a prime candidate for illness. Illness was not considered to be an excuse for rest and relaxation, unless it was debilitating. Many illnesses, which were only painful, he suffered with a quiet courage that has been seldom publicized. Teta was a scalp disease that afflicted him due to the unsanitary conditions of his environment. Ringworm, parasitic infestation, and body lice also caused him untold misery. The African, once a proud warrior and dignified human being, had become the tender of livestock. The upkeep of the animals that he cared for was of greater concern to the master than was his own. Most assuredly, since he had in his possession no personal grooming implements with which to affect personal hygiene considerations, he was unkept and unclean. The damage done to his self-esteem can only be imagined. His ability to endure and survive where others obviously could not has to be admired. Before long, a new generation would come to know the degradation of slavery. This generation, the descendant of the African, did not possess the protective influence that one's own culture can provide. They would be born in slavery. Unlike the African who became a slave, they would know nothing but slavery. They would be slaves in mind, body, and spirit. The Tree of Life depicts generation of blacks being supported by prior generations from which we draw our strength and endurance. No matter what we are called to suffer or overcome, we shall survive as a people. slaves, whose responsibilities included preparing the master's food, had to make sure that her hair was covered at all times. In addition, due to her inability to comb it, for lack of a comb, she was understandably quite sensitive about its appearance. It was in this manner that the hair of the black woman disappeared from view until the latter part of the 19th century. Because of the semi-decent treatment that was afforded her, relative to that given the field slave, the house slave in time adopted an air of superiority when in the presence of field slaves. It bothered her that the master could not stand to look at her uncombed hair. She made sure that he would never have to suffer that experience. not long before she became a popular item in the form of salt and pepper shakers. The popularity of these caricatures of blacks gain and diversified to include old black Joe. This character of the house slave in later years came to be known as Aunt Jemima. This famous caricature would later be copyrighted and would appear on the breakfast table of virtually every home in America.
Other caricatures would depict blacks as a race of people with little drive and less intelligence. This boy playing his accordion, with his features exaggerated, gives one some insight to the way white America viewed blacks. Come on, Sarah, we got the air for dark. Yeah. We got to go home and feed these children. Yeah, be getting dark soon. Yeah. Come on, baby. Come on, boy. The field slave lived a life that was in marked contrast to that of the house slave. Laboring from sunup to sundown, he had little to stimulate his mind. His thought, action, and speech revolved around fulfilling the wishes of the master. Life for the field slave was one of perpetual drudgery and pain, and the only avenue of escape, death. men, their children, if too young to put in a day's labor, tagged along behind them, protected by their youth from the exhausting demands of slave life, their minds sought stimulation in deep imaginings. Black mothers, in noticing the bleaching effect that washing with strong lye soap had on their hands, began to apply lye soap to their children's faces in order to lighten their complexion. This was done in an attempt to lessen the pain that they had come to associate with blackness. What you doing to him? Why don't you do something for that nappy hair? This child got the nappiest hair I ever seen. Mama, you don't have to say things like that about my baby. Well, if you had listened to me in the first place, his hair wouldn't be that nappy. The mother would also pinch the child's nose to make them less broad and press the child's lips upward in order to suppress their natural fullness. Thus, the African-American mother, engaged in the suppression of the child's natural features, was expressing a form of self-hatred and planting its seed in the mind of her child. of womanhood did not extend to the black woman who was often called upon to satisfy the sexual desires of a white master. The product of these sexual encounters between black slave and white master resulted in the creation of the mulatto, a person who is by definition half white and half black. The mistress of the house involved herself in more important things than monitoring the activities of her husband. My skin's improving, don't you think? Yes, missus. Deprived of their traditional comb, the black mother found grooming to be a difficult task for her and for her child. that child hair like that. You're calling it too hard. Don't call me like that. Oh, Mama, I hope my child's hair don't come out like that. 
The black child came to associate grooming with pain due to the inability of the European-style comb to pass freely through his hair. The black mother, in time, came to dread the process and did not look forward to it. It was a painful experience for her and for her child. Okay, honey. You sure got some pretty children. Pretty hair. And a cute, pretty little girl. Oh, look at that. Isn't it pretty? She has some pretty children. That pretty hair. Pretty baby. Pretty skin. Pretty skin, pretty hair. The mulatto, whose complexion and hair texture approximated that of the masters, assumed a position of superiority in the minds of most blacks. The black woman who had the good fortune to reach old age with esteem for her wisdom and knowledge, which she shared unselfishly with the fruit of her loins. She came to be the undisputed ruler of the home due to the unpredictable manner in which slavery dealt with the black male. Without her influence and guidance, the road would have been considerably harder. You know, this fault looked just like a comb that I left back home. I want to go home to my far away home, my home where I belong. Bone. This home is not the one where I belong. I want to go back home. I want to go home. That far away home, my home where I belong. I worked my fingers to the bone. This home is not the one. Where I belong, I want, I want to go back home. Child, your call was left at home. I want to go home. To that far away home. It has been difficult for blacks to accept America as their home. The actions of America has made it so. I can see the head, I can see the head. Let's see. Nice. Yes. 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 Yes
thin lips. Nice nose, yes, good baby. Pretty baby. Upon the giving of birth, the first concern of the mother generally revolves around the complexion and hair texture of the child. Features approximating the masters were most desired by the mother and considered to be a premium. As the child grew older, the concern of the mother was whether or not the hair would remain straight or become kinky. Beautiful, beautiful little baby. You're going to be the cutest, precious little baby in the world. Mommy's going to shape that nose so that you're going to have such a pretty little nose and just the sweetest little lips. Don't worry, baby. Mommy's going to take care of that. As the child continued to develop, the mother clearly applied pressure to the nose and lips to influence their shape. To control head life and other parasites, the slaves commonly applied sulfur to the scalp. Many blacks still apply it to the scalp today, convinced of its conditioning powers. Thus a product which served the slave beneficially in keeping him free of parasitic infestation is today a source of black exploitation. But now you know what, honey? You don't have to pull that water out. You can take it and wash your hair. See, it's got enough oil in it. And you know when you work out in the field, you know how your hair dry out. Dishwater, because of the grease it contained, was commonly used to clean and moisturize the hair. The slave, who had little, wasted nothing. When you wrap your hair, it keeps it from getting all tangled and balled up. And when you wrap it like that, and it's easier to comb. See how soft and easy it is? Isn't it so fun? That's it. That's it, honey. Just let it sit a while and mix it in rainwater. It'll be all right. This is how you wash and clean your hair, dry clean your hair. Now you can't wash it. You take and raise your scalp. Then you take the cornmeal and part it off, each part. And you put some in each part. And rub it in after you get it all through your hair. Then you just take your hand and massage it in your scalp and all through your hair. Then you take and get you some cotton. Go out to the barn and bail it away if you live on the farm and go out there to the barn and get some cotton and lace it between your comb. And then you take it and take it and kind of rub your scalp with the teeth of the comb. And then comb it. And all the comb will come out in the comb. And all the lint, dirt, Dry skin come out in your comb. You see how it comes 
and we are coming out. Black women who believe that the wetting of their hair during their menses was taboo often use a dry cleaning process to clean their hair. While the women were affecting hair grooming techniques which allowed them to keep their hair clean and manageable, black men were developing grooming techniques of their own. Black men frequently applied axle grease to their hair to induce it to lay down and appear straight. White America first you mean, and then popularized black features in its efforts to sell her commercial products. The application of axle grease to the hair also gave the slave a youthful look, thanks to the dying effect, which allowed him to convince the master that he could still do a good day's work. of the hair, the slave employed a lye, lard, and potato mixture which he then applied to the hair. Lye, being extremely caustic, often left him with scalpel burns, which he was willing to endure in order to possess hair like his master. And the seed begins to leave its scars. mother soon found out that heat was straightened the hair. See if I can get something made to do these gals here with. Cause I'm tired of these girls cleaning about their hair. I wish you would, Charlie. I so wish you would. I'm gonna see about it.
Mirror. I got these from the blacksmith. One of these ought to work in the mill. Gals here. comb at birth was clumsy and awkward to use. However, due to the ease with which blacks could straighten hair with it, it remains with us to this very day. The black child, knowledgeable of the difficulty that the grooming of her hair presented her mother, could not help but detect the delight it gave her mother to comb the hair of the white girl before her. Her hair, which was difficult to comb, had to be straightened and then hidden under a head rig. It became a source of shame and embarrassment for her. Thus the black child came to the inevitable conclusion that there was something wrong with her. A virtue that this white girl possessed eluded her. A virtue that her own mother desired. She would do everything within her own power to attain it. church by singing Amazing Grace. system with light-skinned blacks looking down on their dark-skinned brothers. They were the so-called blue vein, children of the master. Denied by their daddy, they nevertheless loved him deeply. All were welcome to the services held at the black congregation. It seemed their policy was more in tune with the Christian doctrine being preached. Their lowly position prohibited their discriminating against anyone. They were the dark keys with their so-called bad hair, the clips, dominant features which resembled the African, loved only by their Jesus. figures were usually less lenient with the black child regarding his shortcomings than they were with the lighter skinned black. Today is Monday. <clears throat> M-O-N-D-A-Y. And with Lee, for heaven's sake, haven't I told you about coming to this classroom with all of that lead in your head? I'm going to tell your mama to cut this hair off. For heaven's sake, boy, can't you come lit out your head before you come to school? Why do you always come to school with all this lit in your head? Haven't I told you about coming to class with, without pulling your hair? I'm going to tell your mama, and when I do, I'm going to tell her to cut off 
all that stuff off of your head. Your hair is so nappy, and you just won't do anything about it. Go over there and sit down, boy. The teacher was just mother at school, reinforcing the inferiority seat. children, we're going to work some arithmetic. Mary, would you like to come up and work this problem for me, please? Well, very, very good, Mary, very good. And you look so nice this morning. And uh, your hair is combed so neat and you're dressed so well. You just come to school looking so clean and everything. Go back and have a seat. Very good. Emily! <laughs> All right, young man, how about you? Why don't you come up and see if you can maybe work uh, uh, an arithmetic problem for me. Let's, let's try one in division. Let's see if you can work that for me. Very good, very, very good. Yes, and look, I see you uh, wash your face before you come to school, and you comb your hair, and it, it just looks so nice and, and looks so neat. Nice, fella. Keep the good work up, fella. Very, very good. Edward Lee, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, but I don't want my hair cut. I cut Evelyn's hair for you. Good morning to you, too. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, I'm just so glad to see him with this nice haircut. You look so much better, Edward Lee. I'm so glad that you, you just you just look like a different young man this morning. I got tired of looking at it, too. Caroline, your hair is ready for school tomorrow. Now, I want you to go over there and get that lard and grease your legs before you go to bed. Get this comb off of my tape. Yes, Mom. Mom, you know, that boy I was telling you about the, the other day, that Edward B., you know I got his mama to, comb, to cut his hair off, and do you know he looks so much better? So much better. Girl, me and your daddy didn't work all these years to send you to Not school, baby. for you to go to school to change them kids. If they black, they black. If they got big nose, they got big nose. If they got a big mouth, they got big mouth. If they got curly hair, they, they got curly hair. So what you trying to change them for? We want you to put something in their head. Well, Mama, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get something in their head, but you you got to remember my daddy is not black. I didn't marry him for his color. I married him because I love The teachers. Those to whom we look for salvation could not save themselves from the inferiority syndrome. Products such as gold dust illustrates how blacks were used to publicize commercial products. Blacks were generally depicted in a distorted form which gave the impression that they were incapable of serious action or thought. This racist depiction completely denied blacks the luxury of receiving any positive feedback from their environment fun to wash left no doubt in the mind of white women that black domestics absolutely found it fun to do their dirty laundry. Nigger hair coupons were considered valuable and were exchanged quite openly in America. They were connected with nigger hair tobacco, so named because its long black tobacco fibers reminded whites of black hair. International Harness Soap. Since it was blacks who maintained the leather goods of America, advertising usually depicted their faces. Brown Beauty Tobacco. A recognizable face first appeared on a tobacco can. Thus, a myriad of products used the black face in a blatantly degrading manner to advertise their products to the world. Blacks appeared as Old Black Joe, Uncle Remus, and Jemima, and countless others. The psychological effect that it had on blacks of the time can only be imagined, since no scientific studies were ever done. 
However, they do constitute a visible record of the sickness that allowed one man to so totally disregard the sanctity of another. Black faces with their features grossly distorted appeared on every conceivable product that America had to offer. With total disregard for the psychological long-range effects this pernicious form of advertising would inevitably have. Blacks appeared on the food products of America, and such figures as Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima, even though they have undergone a cosmetic transformation, still remain to remind us of a period when a black face on a can had freedom of movement, which the black person was uniformly denied. This open contempt that white America felt for blacks makes it difficult to understand why so many blacks desire to imitate someone they could never be. Thus, telling the world of the genuine dislike they felt for themselves. Nevertheless, when white entrepreneurs began to realize the strong desire that blacks had for white features, they moved to help blacks fulfill that desire. pressing became common, the black woman was finally successful in her desire to emulate her white mistress. Her ingenuity once again served her well when she devised a way to prolong the curl in her hair through the use of paper rolls and lard. By tying her hair up before retiring, the paper rolls served the purpose which modern rollers serve today. Thus, the black woman had taken brown paper and transformed it into a useful product all in an effort to disassociate herself from her natural beauty, an undertaking in which no other race have collectively participated. Only put it on the hair instead of putting it on the scalp so you won't get any steam burns when you go in there for pressing. Mm -hmm. Only on the hair. Now we are ready to press. Always temper your irons with the rag so you can see to the blue smoke come instead of the black smoke before you touch the hair. Go as close to the wrist, but don't go to the wrist. To the scalp. Close to the scalp, partner. Now, how often are we supposed to do this? You should do it at least uh, every two weeks. You should try to shampoo and press your hair. Once we use lard to soften the hair, does this take the place of lard? It will excel large, a hundred percent. This will give a beautiful sheen into your hair and even soften it. And it also, also takes care of the skin. And will take care of the skin. By the time Sarah McWilliam Walker, who was later become Madam C.J. Walker, came along the inferior seed which had been planted upon the arrival of the African had been reinforced generation to generation. It set the stage for the commercialization of an outward display of that which had transpired inwardly. Madame Walker's success was a testament to the fact that blacks did not like the way they look. Madame Walker practiced publicly and prospered doing that which a generation of blacks had been doing privately. Mm. How's it feel? Yeah. Oh man, it feel? It's all right. Is yeah. it all right? Is oh, it burning? Yeah. Oh, huh? just a little bit, but I can take it. I can, can take, you take it. Just a few. You a man, ain't you? Yeah. Well, I know you was. Oh, my lady gonna love me now. That's almost mm. like mine. Woo! Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I want it like yours. Okay, okay. Man, now hold still. Okay, but the, you bring a tear, but it's worth. It. Oh, Ooh, man, this stuff is getting there. Ooh, man, yeah. I can feel it working. Oh, I like that. What's oh, man, it's working, brother. Yeah, let it work. Ooh, I'm making it straight. I'm making it oh, straight. You're yeah. going to love this. Oh, Ooh, the women. Mm -hmm. We're going to go nuts. Oh, you, sugar baby. 
Mm -hmm. Man, I want ways for the babes, huh? girls for the girls. Oh, I know that, Junior. Oh, do it right there. Oh, you I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it's it. It's starting to burn a little bit, but I can huh? take it. Can you take it? Mm. Just a little bit more, because it's, it's almost okay. there, but it's getting straight. Okay, okay. Ooh, this stuff is getting straight. Yes, don't on stop now. now. Okay. Hang on, hang on now. Oh, hang man. on now. Let me I get know this. you know what you're doing. Oh, you know I do. Oh. You know I'm best in the business. Oh, just burning just a little huh? bit. Oh, all right, we almost there. We almost oh, there. Oh man! Hold yeah, on. I don't know if I can take it anymore now. Hold on, just a, just a. You better call the fire. Let this scene demonstrate what blacks are willing to endure to look like the master. They are willing to risk permanent scars and permanent baldness to disassociate themselves from their natural heritage. Innovative individuals like Madam C.J. Walker, who were responsible for influencing the black hair care movement, included George Johnson, who introduced the permanent relaxer among blacks. Now the black woman, like the white woman before her, had a way to chemically straighten her hair. That's a relaxer that you apply to it and it will straighten her hair. Will it straighten it out forever? Not forever, only until there's new growth and then you reapply the product again. I like to use your product on my hair. Great, I have some in the car. Sure, go get it. I'll be right back. Willie. Bob Bell. Bob, how are you? Finding yourself. Glad to see you, man. Neighbors miss you. Just back a couple of days. When did you get back from Africa? Just back a couple of days ago, me and the family. Good, good, good. I read about the African movement here in America. Yes, it's just going. And I brought you something. It's an African comb. It is so different. Can you use it? Well, I got to learn, but... It works. It works. Yes, I can use it. I can make this. I can make that. I know I can. Everybody needs one. Through the efforts of one man, Willie El Moro, the black man was reunited with the comb that could navigate his hair freely. Thus, when the Afro hairstyle became popular as an instrument for expressing his new black pride that radically changed black thinking in the 60s, he had a comb that would allow him to artistically care for it. Willie Mora began at once to commercially produce the African comb, and in a short time, its availability contributed much to the growing popularity of the Afro hairstyle. This reunion of the African-American with the comb of his past represents the first time that black America gave recognition to an African tool for its needs. And they used it. It had taken 400 years for the comb of the African-American to find him in his new home. It was indeed a joyous reunion. America, which viewed the Afro as an expression of black defiance for the American system, or perhaps the first spark of love for himself, which echoed in the words, black is beautiful, did not accept or allow the teaching of this hairstyle by barber schools. Unfortunately, the spark, which never turned into a flame signifying the acceptance of self and the love of self, perish. Students, for the next couple of days is gonna be Students' Day. And today we're gonna to do Nancy's hair and we're gonna learn how to do lie relaxer. And tomorrow we're gonna to learn how to do pressing curls with the straightening comb. When are we going to learn how to do the afro? We don't teach that here. Well, a lot of my friends were, and I think it's something we need to learn. Well, it's it's not on the curriculum, and we're not te you're not going to be tested for it. That's one of the reasons why I'm here to learn. Well, I'm sorry. I don't make the rules here, and it's, you know, it's just something we don't offer here, and we don't even offer that service. Well, I want to learn, too. Well, you're just going to have to learn it on your own. Blacks, unlike white hair care specialists, who tend to promote trends, have had to create totally new processes from scratch, including the cold wave curl, formulated by Willie L. Morrow. <laughs> Would it 
if you had done what I told you in the first place, this hair wouldn't be like that. Marriage offered a permanent solution for the elimination of bad hair. My grandmother's from Mississippi. She had a cabin like this. She married a light-skinned man. My mother married a light-skinned man.